This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. After how good the semifinals were in college football, we were due for a clunker last night, and we got exactly that. 65-7, to the final score. I turned it off before halftime, which I feel like was a good decision on my part. So we're going to turn the page forward and talk about something else, literally anything else for today. We're going to talk about <laughs> some NBA and some PGA, but bringing on Brandon Gadula back on the show to talk about both those things. We're having a, a more of an NBA focus as we get into the NFL postseason. We'll be talking about NBA at least twice a week throughout the postseason, and then uh, hopefully more after that as well. We'll talk to Brandon, Tom Vecchio, be on tomorrow, talk about NBA as well, and also talk some golf. Brandon, happy Tuesday. Tuesday to you. How you doing? Oh uh, yeah, I'm good. I was talking to you, making a joke um, about that national championship game. I think I, I was trying to find it in our Slack messages. I think I said it was going to be like 28-3 at halftime. Yeah, you were off. I was, um, you undersold Jordan, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, I mean, I tried, but you know, hey, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, the second that Stetson Bennett had like that, like 20 yard touchdown, I was like, oh no, <laughs> this yeah. is not going to be fun. But hey, you know, either way, uh, congrats to Georgia. Congrats to TCU for making it there. Like, obviously, it's not the way you wanted to go, but great season by them. Happy for uh, our friend of the show, uh, Parker, for a Stats of War on Twitter for, I think, having a great year, uh, having a lot of fun, hopefully, watching all that. But we're going to break down what uh brandon sees across the nba for tonight break down that talk about his nba process and more to get you said for today's slate of nba but first a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher google Podcasts, etc etc you can find us there by searching for covering the spread hit subscribe and if you like what you hear Leave us a rating and review as well. Uh, we also have our wild card first look posted. I broke down what, what my numbers say about wild card weekend uh, spots from scenes of value. There is a money line spread in the total in there. And then one more spread. I will likely lock in later on this week. That is up on the covering the spread podcast feed and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Looking to get more out of the NFL this season? Well, now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's three bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to touchdown scores to over under yards. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss out on your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in free bets when you join FanDuel. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21-plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is non-withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Kansas and Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700. And in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET. Let's dig into the NBA for tonight. But before we do that, though, Brandon, this is the first time we've had you on to talk about the NBA on this show. So I wanted to dig in primarily to your process and let people know what steps you go through before filling out a bet slip for the NBA. So what does your individual process look like for betting NBA? Yeah, so the like the crux of how I project out games, like the sort of bones or like the nuts and bolts not that surprising i'm just inputting offensive and defensive ratings or points per 100 possessions for and against uh for a team into a matchup and then tweaking those with adjustments based on things like you know home court advantage rest stuff like that uh so basically you're, you take a team's efficiency stats compare them to their opponents and then it should tell you what the final score should be i do this all just in spreadsheet i'm sure there's a lot of software that uh, people a lot smarter than me could use, but for me, a spreadsheet uh, does the trick. So 
you know, that's pretty straightforward, but as with most models, it really comes down to a few things. One, which inputs do you use? That's really step one. Uh, that's kind of a long one. Lots can go into it. Do you use a team's full season stats for NBA? Do you look at the past five games, 10 games? How are you adjusting for opponents faced? There's obviously no single answer or else there would just be one, one NBA model that existed. And obviously we know that that's not the case, uh, but these are the types of questions that you need to answer. Uh, for me, what I would assume I do uh, differently than most is I don't really look at any sort of like five game, 10 game splits anymore. I just let injuries do the heavy lifting, taking a page out of your playbook in terms of finding relevant samples um, across all sports. You know, <clears throat> it's super important uh, to, to be looking at injuries because in the NBA, obviously you have five players on the floor at all times, taking one player out of that rotation, 20% of the lineup. Obviously, some players are worth even more than that 20%. Um, and so, like, you know, you, you can't just be taking uh, these static samples or full season numbers. Obviously, you know, it, that can be tricky to figure out. Where I go to help with that is uh, pbpstats.com. It has a Wowie tool, which is with or without you. That's what that stands for. Um, it lets you look up team splits for both when players were in the game or not. So basically whether they were active or not, you know, binary or whether they were on the floor or not. Now you don't want to look at like, even like even within this, it's tricky. Cause like you can't just look at on off right. splits and that's traditionally what's mostly available because players aren't playing 48 minutes a night. So you can't just look at a team, you know, the Portland trailblazers with uh, Damian Lillard on the floor for 48 minutes. That's not going to get you you know, in, in the right ballpark either. So um, this is like a subject, like there's a subjectivity angle to this uh, for which splits I use. And it can vary team to team uh, based on how large a split is. Sometimes you want to look at a, you know, a situation where someone's out, but there's only been one or two games where a player's actually been out. So then you try to figure out, you know, what do I do with him in terms of whether he was on the floor, off the floor, uh, everything like that. And I mean, like, I, I, I feel like I laid out the fact that like the nuts and bolts of this pretty simple, but mm. then you have to figure out like, who is worthy of looking like is the eighth man, the sixth man in a rotation, someone who's not that relevant, that player is out. Does that make sense to shorten a sample to look at that? Maybe sometimes not sometimes. And this is the part that is all. Um, and, and in having talked to you, about your NFL model, I know that there's a lot of, you know, tweaks that you make that other people might not make on how you value things. So it, it's really, you know, it's a simple thing, but then you have to figure out how to put the data in there that you trust. And then from there, uh, you know, you have to answer the question of like, okay, you figure out, I think this team's going to have a, a 115 offensive rating. I think that's their relevant offensive rating. They're playing a team with a 105 defensive rating. How do you get there? Um, like what, what do you, what, how do you project their expected offensive rating? Is it averaging? Is it scaling to a league average, whatever? Uh, personally, I do the league average thing. I think that works better for me. How do you scale for travel rest, all that stuff. So, I mean, I know that probably sounds like a bit much, but honestly, um, an NBA model is a lot easier than a golf model. <laughs> and I started with the golf model, so it feels a bit simple and, you know, for anyone who's interested in doing any of this, any of this work, maybe I made it sound a little bit too complicated with like the, the in or out stuff, but you can find how to like build a basic model on YouTube. And then from there, it's just up to you to input what you think the numbers are going to look like for that given night. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's about my process. I'm, I'm digging through injury reports and then putting the numbers I think make the most sense for a particular matchup for that night. I think the key point you made there was looking at um, the on-off stats based on whether the player was active, because that is a big difference than on-off splits, like you were saying. And I think that that's kind of worth digging into a bit more. When you go to pbpstats.com, is there a default where it's based on if the player is active or is that a true on-off split? Or how do you, if people want to duplicate your process, just rip off your stuff, basically. Um, how do they, hypothetically for me, um, how do they get it to where it is based on when that player is active? So I have a lot of stuff bookmarked. Um, yeah. I basically have, cause I'm doing this every day for every team. Um, and if you go to pbpstats.com, big shout out to, to them. Um, this is a, a 
free resource that, that I'm on have. it right now and I have no, no paid account at all. It's great. <laughs> so uh, I believe it's under on off at the top of the page and then to Wowie, it gives you basically uh, a blank slate to go okay. through and you can fill out the team uh, that you're looking for, whether it's regular season, how many starters are on the floor, you know, what quarter it is um, the leverage tool I do use. I factor out low level, uh, low leverage possessions. I should have mentioned that. Um, but then from there, uh, you just input, you know, your player filters, it, you know, is Joel Embiid, he's, you know, questionable for tonight's slate, put him in, you know, after you select the Sixers, do you want him, do you want to see, you know, action with him playing in the game, not playing in the game on off, all that kind of stuff. You can combine that. And then, uh, you know, you just click get team stats. For me, I changed to 100 possessions instead of total so that I can see the net ratings easily. And then you have uh, some good data there uh, that you can look at. And while we're giving some some love to this site, they have a thing called shot quality. Uh, if you scroll over, once you actually get some stats uploaded, uh, shot quality is basically an expected effective field goal percentage. You can look at that number and see, you know, if a team's at a 0.51 in terms of expected shot quality, but they have a, you know, 0.55 actual effective field goal percentage they're either overperforming or maybe they're just a good team yeah. that's a question you can ask and, and maybe scale back or scale up manually but there's a lot you can do uh and again to simplify everything building in it like the the structure of an NBA model is super easy but as we all know it's about the inputs that you that you determine are the most impactful now one other thing i wanted to dig into quickly is with the trade deadline a month away and the all-star break a little bit more than a month away we're gonna see some guys missing time who we're gonna see a lot of guys missing time but like maybe players who have missed a lot of time so far so you mentioned deciding how to weigh a small sample active versus inactive split versus the on off splits when you have a smaller sample like that is it like a are you doing that kind of just based on, you know, guts, uh, based on what you think that player is worth? Are you kind of utilizing that as kind of the crutch manually deciding where to put things or how do you handle those small samples? Because we will see a lot of them in, in the very near future. So early in the season, um, the, the research I've come across says that uh, a lineup sample will sort of stabilize around 500 possessions, which I think sort of makes sense. It's mm -hmm. roughly five games worth of, of data. Um, so I regress things out toward a league average if a sample is below 500 possessions. And okay. typically uh, that happens earlier in the year. One great thing about the NBA is that it's very predictable once you know what in, like who's in, who's out, that right. kind of stuff. It's pretty predictable. Um, but at this point in the season, most samples I'm looking at do have at least 500 possessions, so I don't worry too much. But if I see a small sample or I see something weird, like for example, I, I mentioned Joel Embiid. Mm -hmm. you know he's questionable they actually have better splits in games with Embiid out but James Harden and Tyrese Maxey active than with all three active in terms of net rating and like that seems wrong long term yeah. and you don't just want to plug that in blindly and say like well they're they're kind of a bad team with those three active it's not really the case um right so there's just that amount of like you know I think you said the, the gut field. There is a big part of that uh, yeah. for me, uh, for sure. I mean, similar to the NFL, like I'm not going to upgrade the 49ers or downgrade them if Jimmy Garoppolo comes back right. um, just because Brock Purdy played well. Like yeah. logically, you would think Garoppolo would be an upgrade still. So yeah. I think that there is always going to be an element of trusting your gut with that stuff. Now, let's spin this forward and talk about tonight. We do have a couple of nationally televised games tonight. we got the Thunder at the Heat and the Suns at the Warriors on tonight's slate. Both those games uh, sporting, uh, one of them, I guess, sporting a pretty lofty spread with the Suns and the Warriors. What are you seeing with those two games specifically in case one of people want to bet them uh, as they're watching them for tonight? Yes, yeah, so I feel like this is a, a great practical explanation of like what <laughs> I go through because these games are pretty littered with uh, injury reports. Any game mm -hmm. with the Heat is has a pretty lengthy injury report, but um, the Thunder are without Alexei Pukashevsky. Uh, Jeremiah Robinson Earl. They're two impactful players, but not like on the level of a Shea Gilders Alexander or a Josh Giddy. I mean, SGA's got a usage rate over 32%. Giddy's near the top of the league in touches per game. Uh, notably, like Pukashevsky has pretty terrible on off splits. Not that Josh Giddy's are great, but that stuff does matter. Um, the Heat, like game after game, have their entire roster on the injury report. So they're honestly a team I try to ignore when I can. You know, 
I do write content. And if I find that, uh, I mean, like step one for me is to figure out who, which key players are questionable and then just not look at those games unless I have to, right. You know, if I can't find some more in, uh, valuable information, then I'll look at things with and without those guys and figure out um, what the right play is there. But, um, you know, NBA betting is kind of a volume game and there are a lot of opportunities to look past the, like these teams, but, you know, for tonight, uh, you know, national television, you want you want some action sometimes. Um, and you should always only, you know, make, make, you know, take action wherever you feel good. And we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get to that point, whether I actually feel good <laughs> or not about this, but uh, they list uh, Tyler hero, uh, Bam Adebayo is questionable. Kyle Lowry's out. Caleb Martin, not as important, but he's also out. Sorry, Caleb. I know you're listening, but um, so if I run the game without or with uh, hero and Adebayo active, I really see this as like a no action situation. Mm-hmm. It's really efficient. Um, I have the spread and the over under off by just 0. 0.4 points, yeah. which would be a lean toward the heat to cover into the over, but they're not bets that I would make. No. Um, they've yet to play a game with Jimmy Butler, but without a whole trio of Lowry hero and at a bio. Uh, so this is one of those spots where like, okay, maybe look at uh, games with Butler, but those three off the floor. Mm-hmm you're going to see some possessions with Butler off the floor in that sample as well, but Jimmy Butler's not going to play 48 minutes um, tonight. So, you know, that, I think that that's so valuable. Uh, Again, I'd see no value on the over under, but I would actually view the thunder as favorites by a decent margin. So if we get news that those guys are all out, I would lean uh, and I would actually take some action, small action on the thunder uh, to cover if and when we get that information. For the Warriors and Suns, uh, the Suns have been a weird team. They've been, you know, they've had stints with and without Devin Booker. He's currently out. I've often found them to be overrated because they're a pretty bad team without him, but even with Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton. And I think it's one of those spots where, like, the name value is still there for those guys, mm-hmm. but their splits are not actually good. And Devin Booker is what makes that team flow. The Warriors just got Andrew Wiggins back, uh, played, I think, 19 minutes. They're lifting, listing Steph Curry as questionable, but I've seen on Twitter from a beat reporter that he's probable. So if you use their recent splits, you're going to be way off base because you're going to be looking at games with with no Wiggins and Curry, two very impactful players, especially Curry. Um, these guys have basically been out since like mid-December. Um, so, it, you know, that's a perfect example of the kind of thing that you're facing each and every day whenever you're looking at, you know, betting the NBA. So I can't really get behind the 10-point spread. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't imagine that Curry and Wiggins play their full minutes if they're favored by this much. You know, DeAndre Ayton might sit as well. Like the, the Suns are all completely, they could be toast. So I'm not really seeing a whole lot of value um, with the spread, but I do like the under because okay. of the the anticipation that Curry and Wiggins may not pl- have to play a, a full minutes allotment. But even before I just assume that, you know, Golden State has a good defense. Uh, this one should play a bit differently than than they have in the past two matchups with, you know, Booker healthy, the Suns without all those guys active, they play slower. They play more like an average team in terms. Well, they're like below average offensively, but above average defensively. That's an under friendly uh, situation. So I, I would go with the under in this one. Yeah, that's a 228 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Minus 110 on the under. It is higher at FanDuel than it is some other spots. So if you want to bet the under on that game, FanDuel will likely be, as of now at least, Tuesday morning, the best spot to get that. We do have five other games on tonight's slate. It's not a lot in those two games. But what else are you seeing on the board at FanDuel for tonight? Another uh, subjectivity situation that you could factor in. We have revenge. Ooh, I'm in. Uh, I don't even know. I don't need the rest of the analysis. What's the revenge here? Just can you, can I bet revenge? What's the odds on revenge? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Minus Don- 1,000. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell and the Cavs uh, in Utah to face the Jazz. Um, but I have Utah to cover pretty easily at, at uh, their four-point underdogs. Um, they're a pretty scrappy team. They have a good net rating. They can score points. But I also like the over in this game. They tend to allowing uh, allow scoring in games in Utah. Games average uh, 237 points. Total is 226 and a half currently, or was when I, before we started recording. 227 now. So that's going to be tiny still, bit. I still like that. Um, you know, two good offenses and a, a situation where uh, there should be some points. Uh, and, and then another game that's not super bogged down by like unpredictable injuries. I can deal with out tags. Like that's easy. But the questionable tags are, are tougher. So yeah. uh, a game without a whole lot of them. 
for impactful players uh, between Portland and Orlando. Um, Portland has had a lot of stints without Damian Lillard. Uh, he's a game changer. His net rating is a plus 13 and a half. If you look at the team with and without him, that's super important. Orlando in the midst of a road trip. Portland returning from a road trip. Um, I have Portland to cover uh, minus seven and a half. Yeah, it's seven and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, and it's also seven and a half elsewhere for that one as I'm going to go ahead and just take that <laughs> now. Uh, following along, being a great host and listening to you intently just so I can get uh, my own selfish games gains out of those. So uh, the ones Brandon's seeing right now, uh, he likes uh, Portland minus seven and a half. And that game he likes Jazz and Cavs over 227. Jazz plus four, if you can still get that. And then Warrior Suns. Under 228, the primary ones where Brandon is seeing value across the NBA right now. Well, Brandon on uh, throughout the offseason as well. Talk some more NBA, but also to talk some golf. So let's talk about that right now and break down the Sony Open in Hawaii. That is the event for this weekend in the uh, PGA. They're at Wildlife Country Club in Hawaii uh, for this week. And obviously that's going to dictate a lot of things. So before we dig into the actual field, what do we need to know about Wildlife Country Club? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a week with like not a particularly uh, strong field, which is pretty common uh, for the Sony Open. But it's the it's the type of course where irons and putting to get to birdies is what's important. Um, not a single driving stat is vital. Um, you can actually kind of give some weight to driving accuracy if you want. But, you know, you need birdies. Seven of the past 10 winners have been at least 20 under par. None of them are super big hitters. I know reading lists of names is not fun, but like just stick with me here. It's only 10. Was it really only nine? But Hideki Matsuyama, Kevin Na, Cameron Smith, Matt Kuchar, Patton Kazire, Justin Thomas, uh, Fabian Gomez, Jimmy Walker back to back, and Russell Henley. Um, if you're following golf pretty heavily, you know that those are not uh, guys that we load up on generally at courses that require distance. Um, it's going to come down to, again, you know, have hitting hitting fairways hitting greens and, and making putts sometimes it really is that simple now that does lead to more volatility whenever we have more golfers who are you, you know sometimes we have golfers who are sort of like disqualified from being in contention because they're not long enough we don't really have that so we have more golfers in the field who can contend um so a little bit more volatility this week but i i really think that there's a few few good names at the top of the board that I still like. And I'm excited about one in particular. Okay, well, let's dig into that then. You mentioned uh, the volatility, and that's why we're seeing longer odds here at the top. Tom Kim is a favorite of FanDuel Sportsbook. He is 11 to 1. Sung JM was 14 yesterday. He is now 12. Uh, we got Jordan Spieth at 15 to 1. Hideki Matsuyama 16. And Brian Harmon 18. You mentioned there's someone you like near the top of the odds board. Who is that and what puts you on them and any other outrights you like this week? I asked you like sick questions. I, I expect you to remember every single one. Um, I like Tom Kim. I know I said it's volatile, but he's so good. He's really fun, but he's also just really good. He's easily the best iron player in the field over the past 50 rounds. According to data golf, uh, if there's a knock for me, like on Kim's long-term output, it's that he's not long off the tee. He is super accurate, but he's not long off the tee. But that should work this week. Uh, I could very easily envision uh, Tom Kim's name at the top of that list that I just read off for 2023 of like winner here. Another um, non-distance guy winning it in 2023. Yeah. Um, uh, the irons are so good. He's a really good putter. Uh, I think that it makes a lot of sense. So I'm in on Tom Kim, even at the top of the board at 11 to 1. I still see value there. Uh, I like Brian Harmon. He's now 18 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. He was 21, but I still think that that's, uh, you know, doable. 11th in approach play among the field over the past 50 rounds, 22nd in driving accuracy, which I know is not like a key stat for me, but I definitely don't dislike accurate drivers at this course. Uh, he is ninth in strokes gain Tita green over the past 50 rounds. And he has six straight uh, top 25 finishes, seven in his past eight starts golf and well should fit him well. Um, I think he was third here five years ago, but don't quote me on that. That one's just kind of something that popped into my head. Uh, and then if we want someone a little bit longer odds, uh, Andrew Putnam, uh, 55 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. He is top six in both short game stats. So strokes gained around the green and strokes gained putting ranks 30th in approach play. Really like that combo here. You can kind of look at strokes gained minus off the tee, which I just call like strokes gained fairway through green. He rates out really well there. Um, just a perfect candidate for someone who's going to like upgrade in efficiency at a course like this runner up here in 2019 
Uh, and those are the three outrights that I like the most uh, for this week. Yeah, Brian Harmon finished fourth here back in 2018. I smiled when you mentioned putting him because he kind of popped to me yesterday when I was digging into uh, some of the numbers as we were doing research for our DFS show. Putting him looked like he was oversalaried based on his odds, but then you dig in, it's like, oh, I think his odds might actually just be too long. Yeah. Um, putting him right now, as you mentioned, is uh, 55 to 1 over at FanDuel Sportsman. So Tom Kim, and uh, uh, Brian Harmon, Andrew Putnam, the ones popping there. As far as the non-outrights go, anybody standing out to you in those markets at FanDuel? Um, just a lot of top 10s for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, not a lot, but you know, some. I, I, I still like Putnam and Harmon for top 10s if you want to kind of safeguard or if you don't want to bet. Uh, you know, it, it, look, it's... <laughs> if you had called more cow last week, you thought you were going to win. Um, for him to finish second and you didn't have any any top 10 or top 5 action, like that's, that's tough. Uh, so sometimes, even if I'm betting guys... I'll still protect with a top 10 um, or in each way, depending on where you are. But uh, so again, putting them in Harmon top 10s, I see value there. Billy Horschel, uh, and these are just all guys who fit the course. Billy Horschel top 10, uh, Matt Kuchar, Brendan Todd, Mark Hubbard um, top 10s. I can pull up those odds in a second because I forgot to write them down. But uh, those are all guys who uh, make sense to me for, for top 10s here. And they show value in my in my model for the week. And that's the important thing there is because top 10 markets can sometimes get a little bit holdy. Um, that's not a word that actually exists, but I'm going to use it. It's a little holdy. The hole can get pretty high in those. They can hold, you know, hide the hole better. Uh, but putting them right now is five to one uh, to finish top 10. Harmon is plus 195. Kucher is also five to one. Uh, Horschel, I did not look up yet. 360 but I will do plus 360. 360. Okay. So Horschel is plus 360. And then Brendan Todd, plus another staple. Uh, another staple of courses like this yeah, yeah seven to one todd's irons have also looked a little bit better recently um, too. yeah so I don't, I don't think that's totally outrageous either um but i think that those are all interesting and they fit the course like you said uh at least two of them putting them and uh todd were guys who caught my attention yesterday and i was taking in some stuff so glad we're somewhat on the same page which probably means we'll be having a lot of overlap in our dfs show later on today well i don't know if you'll be on mark hubbard he's uh 11 to one to top 10, same as Tom Kim to win outright. So, uh, <laughs> you know, look, you have, you have top 10 markets for a reason. Yeah. Love them. I'm shocked that there are that many top 10 numbers showing value for you because typically, at least for me, it's hard to find value in those spots, but like, again, you're running simulations. So it's not like yeah. it's a, Oh, I can't bet them outright. I'll go here. That, th that thought process is flawed, but you're using actual simulations which gives me at least more confidence in like trying to back this stuff. Yeah. We, we've talked about this, uh, you know, off air with your, Ad you don't really find a whole lot of, you don't find a lot of top 10 value in NASCAR, but I do tend to find it in, in golf. I think sometimes, you know, there are like tiers of top 10 odds. And sometimes I think that guys just get shuffled into like one tier or the next. And I think that there's um, a pretty decent, uh, pretty deep. I don't know. I, I find it, the top tens do well for me so yeah top Sorry, tens were good for me this year that NASCAR. Experience. uh top tens were good for me in nascar last year uh so i decided to completely retool the entire uh -huh. way i do top tens um and i'm currently in the process of like going back to old races and making sure the new process works well and if there are too many guys showing value for top tens i view that as being a red flag because i just get so annoyed with how much hold there is in the market but I think for this week specifically, given that it is a unique kind of setup, um, I think that is encouraging to see the number of top tens. Okay, I feel like we got some pretty good stuff out there in the ether for this week, both for the NBA tonight and for the Sony Open in Hawaii. That has been Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. Brandon, thank you for your time for today, and I will talk to you again later on. Talk some DFS for the Sony Open. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Good luck uh, to everyone tonight and this week. All righty. Again, Brandon is on Twitter. I could do a 13. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. We're back again tomorrow with more NBA talking to Tom Vecchio, getting his read on Wednesday night, talking to the player props with Tom as well. That'll be a delight again. Wild card weekend preview is already up over on the covering the spread feed. We'll talk to you all once again tomorrow. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.